Today I have the pleasure of introducing Prabhjit Barn. Prabhjit is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Health Sciences, Simon Fraser University. Prabhjit holds a Master's of Science degree from the School of Occupational and Environmental Health and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of British Columbia. She is also an Environmental Health Scientist at the BC Center for Disease Control and National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health, where she works on a range of issues related to environmental public health, including indoor and outdoor air quality. I'll turn on my mic. So thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me here today to talk about my thesis research. Um, I just want to start off by saying that this research project, um, also known as UGAR, which stands for the Ulaanbaatar Gestation and Research Air, or Air Pollution Research Study, is a joint uh, project between SSU and the Mongolian National University of Health Sciences. There's uh, UGAR 1 and there's an UGAR 2. So all, my involvement has been with UGAR 1, which follows uh, pregnant women, or followed pregnant women up until they delivered. And the main outcome we were looking at was uh, different indicators of fetal growth. There's also an ongoing uh, follow-up study that will follow the children born in UGAR 1 um, up, in, up until the age of 4. And the main outcome that's being looked at there is neurocognitive development. So I'll give our, uh, the address of our website, the research website, at the end of this presentation for anybody who wants to get more information. So there's growing evidence on the link between exposures, air pollution exposures during pregnancy and uh, different indicators of fetal growth. So this includes decreased birth weight, low birth weight, which is defined as being less than 2,500 grams. Uh, small for gestational age, which takes in, which uh, indicator which takes into account not just birth weight but also gestational age and sex, and then preterm birth, which just looks at gestational age, so babies born less than 37 weeks of gestation. The bulk of the evidence um, consists of observational studies, so these are large studies that make use of routinely measured outdoor um, air pollution concentrations and administrative data like birth records. So while this evidence is really valuable on providing information on this link between air pollution and fetal growth, um, because they are observational studies, they are limited in their ability to um, take into account potentially important confounders, things like maternal smoking or secondhand smoke exposure. Um, a lot of different air pollutants have been linked to different indicators of fetal growth, but the most consistent and strongest effects have been found for PM or particulate matter. And our research project focuses mainly on PM2.5, so that's that fine fraction of the particles, so particles smaller than 2.5 micrometers in volume. Um, there's not a great understanding on how particulate matter might um, affect fetal growth, and most of the evidence on this relationship actually comes from research conducted on PM2.5 and cardiovascular effects. So that research tells us that um, PM can cause, when inhaled, can cause oxidative stress and inflammation locally in the lungs, but because we're talking about fine fraction of PM, these particles can actually be transported across the lungs into the blood, and they can also cause systemic effects, like oxidative stress and inflammation. Uh, PM is also linked to increases in blood coagulation, uh, endothelial dysfunction, as well as changes to hemodynamic processes, such as increases in blood pressure. So we think that during pregnancy, all of these same mechanisms basically work together to reduce um, placental functioning. So lead to placental dysfunction, which ultimately leads to decreased transportation of oxygen nutrients to the fetus, leading to impaired fetal growth. Um, despite the growing evidence of um, research studies looking at air pollution and fetal growth, there's very few intervention studies that have tried to look at this relationship. There's only one randomized control trial currently um, that, look, that looks at air pollution exposures during pregnancy and birth weight. This was a relatively small study that was conducted in rural Guatemala. Um, researchers randomized pregnant women to either receive an intervention, which was a chain stove that vented um, emissions from biomass use, biomass fuel use during cooking to the outdoors or uh, women were randomized to the control group. And the 
control group um, continued to use open fires for cooking. So the researchers found that babies that were born to women in the intervention group um, gave birth to, or were on average heavier, 89 grams heavier, compared to babies that were born to the control group. And again, this is a relatively small study. The effects weren't significant, but it's definitely suggestive of an effect. Um, another study, this is a natural experiment study, found that even very short-term decreases in air pollution during pregnancy can benefit fuel growth. So this study was conducted in Beijing during the Olympics in 2008. Um, during the period of the Olympics, there was a lot of interventions that were put in place by the government to reduce the air pollution concentration. So things like shutting down some heavy industry, taking a lot of cars off the road, relocating uh, people from certain neighborhoods uh, to different parts or outside of the city. And this resulted in huge decreases, up to 50% in some of the concentration of the pollutants. Um, and researchers found that women who had their eighth month of pregnancy fall during this cleaner air period of the Olympics gave um, birth to babies that were on average 23 grams heavier uh, compared to babies born over the same time period, either the year before or the year after the Olympics. And these um, effect sizes aren't very big. So for an individual baby, that may not mean a lot. But if we think about the fact that a lot of people, or everybody is exposed to air pollution, if we're talking about densely populated communities exposed to higher pollution level on a population level, this is a really important. Um, the intervention that we're looking at in our study are portable HEPA filter air cleaners. So that's a picture of an air cleaner here um, as the model that we're using. So these air cleaners um, are equipped with a high efficiency air cleaner or high efficiency filter. And they work by drawing air into the machine across the filter, which captures the particles, and then it releases uh, filtered air. These air cleaners have been studied in um, a lot of homes mostly in relatively low pollution settings. And we found that these air cleaners can reduce concentration substantially, indoor concentration to 7.5, um, upwards to about 60, 70%, depending on the study design. Their use has also been linked to improvements in cardiovascular health endpoints that we think might be important to fetal growth. Um, so they haven't been studied, again, in the context of fetal growth specifically. But if we go back to this, what we think is the relationship between PM and impaired fetal growth, um, air cleaners, even their use over the short term, so less than two weeks, have linked uh, this kind of lower air pollution exposure period brought upon by these air cleaners to lower concentrations of um, markers of inflammation in the blood, uh, increased or uh, improved endothelial function, as well as decreases in blood pressure. These air cleaners, however, have been well studied in high pollution settings. Um, and they also have a study, well studied over longer periods of time. So most of the um, studies that looked at air cleaners have conducted studies of um, over periods of a few days to a couple of weeks. And there's only a handful of studies that have looked at their use for about six months to a year. So our study setting is Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital city of Mongolia. It's also the main urban center of Mongolia. So the population of Ulaanbaatar is about 1.5 million, and that's roughly half the population of Mongolia. Um, it's also known to be one of the most polluted cities in the world. And it's estimated that anywhere between 10 to 25 percent of the mortality is due to air pollution exposure. Um, these high pollution levels are a result of the sources that are present in the city, the climate, as well as the geography. So Ulaanbaatar is located in a valley. So you have mountain ranges to the north and, or to the north and to the south. And it's also the coldest capital city in the world. So in the wintertime, you have cold temperatures. Um, locate, when it's located in this valley, so you get a lot of temperature inversion, which means you have a lot of capping of air close to the ground, a lot of stagnation. And in the presence of sources, the air quality can quickly deteriorate. There's kind of three main sources in the city. So there's residential coal burning, there's three coal-fired power plants in the city, and there's motor vehicles. And every year, the um, contribution of motor vehicle emissions to the city uh, increase. And that's because every year, you have more and more cars and vehicles on the road. There, as I mentioned, there's three coal-fired power plants. And you can kind of make out the, the stacks in the back of this, um, in this background of this slide. So these 
uh, coal-fired these power plants are basically Soviet-era operations. There's very few emission controls on these stacks, um, and these power plants generate all the electricity for all of the high-rise residential apartment buildings, where about 40% of the population lives, as well as for other buildings. Um, and then residential coal burning, which is by far the largest contributor to air pollution concentrations in the city, occurs in um, bear neighborhoods. So this is a picture of a bear. So this is a traditional Mongolian dwelling. This is out in the countryside. Below here we have um, a picture of what a bear neighborhood looks like in Ulaanbaatar. So these bear neighborhoods um, lack a lot of infrastructure, including electricity. So if um, so the residents of these bear neighborhoods rely on the use of solid fuel, which is mainly coal, sometimes wood, for both heating and for cooking. And in each of these bears, you have a stove that looks something like this. And this stove, again, is used for both heating and cooking. And the stoves tend to be very inefficient, so they release a lot of emissions both indoors as well as outdoors. And you can see that each bear, although has a short, short chimney stack, so again, releasing a lot of air pollution at a level where it's available to be breathed in. Um, the Gare neighborhood, as I mentioned, um, about 60% of the population of Ulaanbaatar lives in these neighborhoods, and the Gare neighborhoods continue to grow every year, just because every year you have more migration from the countryside into major urban center, and that's mainly for economic reasons. So I wanted to kind of get across the impact or the importance of this one source in the city. So the first graph here shows the monthly average temperatures um, in Ulaanbaatar, and, you can, and then the other graph shows the monthly, um, or the average monthly PM2.5 concentration. And you can see in the winter months, so around November to February, there's this decrease in the temperatures, and at that same time, you see this drastic increase in PM2.5 concentration. So again, Ulaanbaatar is very unique, compared to other very polluted cities in terms of having this one very dominant source and this very kind of seasonal, strong seasonal effect. Um, just to give you an idea of the pollution levels in, um, in Ulaanbaatar, the average um, yearly PM2.5 concentration just in the city center, so not necessarily in the most highly exposed or highly polluted areas, which would be the bare neighborhood. Just in the city center, the average um, annual PM2.5 concentration is about 75 micrograms per meter cube. In Vancouver, uh, for comparison, it's about five. And the World Health Organization um, annual PM2.5 guideline is 10 micrograms per meter cube. In the winter time, um, if we just look at the winter months, this level can easily double. And again, depending on where you are, it could be easily be much higher. So our study is a randomized control trial uh, where our participants were randomized to receive uh, to either the intervention group or the control group. The intervention group received one or two HEPA filter air cleaners to use from enrollment up until they delivered. Um, and then our control group received no air cleaners. Our study sample consisted of non-smoking women who were 18 years of age or older um, in the early part of their pregnancy, so at about 18 weeks or less, um, in a single gestation pregnancy, and who were residing in apartments. So we decided to exclude women who were living in GARES, so again, potentially the highly, most highly exposed population, for two reasons. One was because we really wanted to assess the impact of outdoor air pollution on fetal growth. So if we included women who were living in GARES, we'd get a lot of that indoor generated pollution as well. The second was more for practical reasons. These air cleaners have to be plugged in. They need a constant supply of electricity. And as I mentioned before, a lot of the Gary neighborhoods lack that um, lack of electricity. Um, our sample size consisted of four, 540 participants. This was our target, and we were able to reach that. And our data collection occurred over two years, so at the beginning of 2014, and we wrapped it up at the end of 2015. So we collected data through um, home visits, through clinical visits, as well as um, through clinical records. And uh, when I say we, I really mean our team in Ulaanbaatar. So we had a really great team there. Uh, we had project coordinators that 
uh, organized all of the data collection, and then they oversaw the clinical visits. And we had a really great team of study technicians that did all of the home visits. So during this, we did uh, two home visits uh, for each participant. So the first one occurred shortly after enrollment, around 11 weeks gestation. And during this time, for the intervention participants, the air cleaner was deployed. And again, we encouraged the participants to run the air cleaners continuously throughout the study period. Um, and then the second home visit occurred around 31 weeks gestation, so in the third trimester. And during both of the, the first home visit and the second home visit, we collected one week of continuous um, particle counts using this particle, Dylos particle counter here. Um, the technicians also conducted a housing questionnaire where they collected information on things like um, the area of the home, the number of rooms, and things like that. Um, and then they also collected the seat collection measurement of the home. In a subset of, um, uh, in a subset of homes, we also collected additional air pollution monitoring. And the main measure we collected here, or main sample we collected here, was a gravimetric PM2.5 sample. And the main reason we collected this was because we wanted to de um, develop an empirical relationship between um, the Dylos particle count and gravimetric PM2.5 so that we could convert our particle count to PM2.5 mass concentration based on our, the data from our study. Uh, the clinical visits also happened around the same time. So the first one was in early pregnancy, the second one was later in pregnancy. Um, during both visits, our project coordinators um, administered a questionnaire, and this, collect this questionnaire collected information on things like uh, demographic and lifestyle factors, health. Um, and then during the second visit only, we also collected whole blood samples and hair samples. The whole blood samples were analyzed for lead, mercury, and cadmium. And I'll only be talking about the cadmium results in this presentation. Um, and then we also collected from a subset of um, participants a hair sample. And this was analyzed for nicotine. And the main reason for analyzing the hair sample for nicotine was because we wanted to see if the hair nicotine was, if we had a good relationship between our blood cadmium concentrations and our hair nicotine concentrations to see if the blood cadmium was acting as a biomarker of secondhand smoke in our study. Um, and then once the babies were born, we collected from clinical records information on birth weight, birth length, uh, head circumference, gestational age at birth, and maternal health during pregnancy. So we had um, kind of three main study hypotheses. The first one was just about the air cleaner. So we, we hypothesized that uh, they would produce major reductions in home indoor concentrations of PM2.5 in this highly polluted community. Um, and then the other two were related to the outcome, uh, uh, birth outcome. So we hypothesized that pregnant women who were in the intervention group uh, would give birth to babies that were uh, had greater mean body weight to gestational age. And then we also hypothesized that the proportion of babies that were born small for gestational age would be smaller in the intervention group than compared to the control group. So the first analysis, again, was just looking at the effect of the air cleaners on indoor PM2.5 and secondhand smoke exposure. So we just published um, that analysis. And for that analysis, this is what our data looked like. So again, we had 540 participants that were randomized to either the control group or the intervention group. We had eight participants that were given the wrong, um, wrong treatment. So we had five participants that should have been in the control group but were accidentally given air cleaners, and three participants in the intervention group that should have received air cleaners but didn't. Um, because we, we, so what we decided to do was basically analyze their data according to what they were assigned and not to what they were given to keep it more uh, in line with an intention to treat analysis. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we had a number of follow-ups, so we had more follow lots. Oh, sorry, we had a number of lots of follow-ups. Uh, we had more in our control group. So we had 19 participants uh, who withdrew for whatever reason in our control group, and nine in our intervention group. And then the last box there shows the number of first home visits that were conducted for the PM2.5 measurements and second home visits uh, for both groups. Uh, we had 382 blood cadmium samples that we. I collected and we analyzed 125 hair samples for nicotine. So this is a uh, map of the homes, or 
city homes as well as our study offices. So the control purchase, the control homes are shown in um, brown, and the intervention homes are shown in blue. And you can also see in the boxes here um, where our study offices are located. And here are the three uh, power plants in the city. And then also uh, there are two government, six site government monitor stations that collect measurements on outdoor air pollution. So from these government uh, sites, we also obtain data um, on outdoor PM2.5 concentrations over our city. This figure um, shows the relationship between our dialysis particle counts and our co-located um, gravimetric PM2.5 samples. So we use this relationship to, again, convert our particle counts to PM2.5 mass concentrations. Um, so we had 23 co-located samples, and we found a very good relationship between the two measures. Um, and this is very consistent with what's been reported in the literature. So um, others have reported relationships between dialysis particle counts and other um, measures of PM2.5, and the relationships they've reported range from about an R squared of 0.7 to 0.99. So we were very happy to see this. Um, this is a very busy table from the first paper uh, that I just showed you. And I don't want you to go through this very carefully. I just, the reason I wanted to show it was to, to, to tell you that we looked at a lot of different baseline characteristics, things like housing, so total area of the home, total age of the home, as well as personal and behavioral characteristics between our control and our intervention participants. And we found that the groups were very similar, which is something that we would expect and we'd want from people to run an ice control trial. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was that um, a large number of our participants lived with smokers. So here in our control group, we had 60%, and in our intervention group, we're just a little bit less than that. Um, so even though our participants are non-smoking themselves, um, secondhand smoke exposures are an important exposure to the patient and population. So we um, looked at air clean effectiveness uh, between intervention and our control home. So we saw that overall the intervention homes had lower PM2.5 concentrations. So these are all of our one week um, indoor PM2.5 concentrations that were measured in these homes. And we found that overall, um, on average, intervention homes were had um, indoor concentrations of PM2.5 of about 29% uh, less compared to control homes. We also conducted a lot of uh, different stratified analyses to look at, like, out to see if some factors influence air cleaner effectiveness. So we looked at air cleaner effectiveness over time. So if you remember, we conducted, we collected uh, one week sample or one week measurements in early pregnancy and then one week measurements later in pregnancy. So there's about a five month gap in between. So the first measurement represents when the air cleaner is newly deployed, and the second measurement represents their use after about five months. So again, we saw uh, lower concentrations in the intervention homes for both the first and second measurements, but we did see a drop in effectiveness. So there were the intervention homes, the concentrations were about 40% lower uh, for the first measurement, and then about 15% lower in the second measurement. And unfortunately, we don't know if this is because the air cleaners were being, um, were just getting clogged and becoming less efficient because of that, or if our participants were just not using the air cleaners as much. So we tried to get this information, um, or tried to collect this information. We, the models of air cleaners that we're using have built-in timers that are supposed to log the number of hours of use. Um, but if they're not turned on in a specific way, that timer isn't initiated. So if a participant turned off their air cleaner for whatever reason at some point, or if there was a power outage and they didn't turn the air cleaner on again in that certain way, the timer uh, wasn't initiated and that data wasn't collected. So that data wasn't very useful. Uh, another way we looked at use was uh, based a little bit more crudely, we just asked the participants in that second clinical visit and during that questionnaire, we just asked them to report um, over the study period, about what percentage did you use of the air cleaner? So the mean, so on average, um, participants said about 65% of the time. So we looked at whether or not that was related to air cleaner effectiveness as well. We reported use of more than 65% of the time versus less, and we didn't really find a difference. Uh, 
Uh, we also looked at air cleaner effectiveness over season. So we looked over the winter, spring, summer, and fall. And again, similar to the other uh, box plots, we see lower concentrations in the winter months. Um, we found higher effectiveness in the winter. Um, and these differences between the seasons were significant, but overall the pattern is something we would expect. So in winter time, homes tend to be more closed, um, which means you're actually letting air cleaner filter the air in the home before you're introducing more um, air from outside, versus in the summer where homes are more open and you're getting a lot more up, um, airflow and more of that outdoor air pollution indoors. And then we also looked at um, whether or not smoking in the homes influenced air cleaning effectiveness. So overall, we saw higher concentrations of PM2.5 in homes with smokers versus homes without smokers. But we didn't really see a difference in air cleaning effectiveness. So air cleaners were slightly less effective in homes with smokers versus not. And then finally, we also looked at the effect of the air cleaner on blood plasma concentrations. So again, we collected these uh, samples, the whole blood samples um, in the second clinical visit, so around the third trimester. And um, the blood cadmium concentrations basically represent uh, exposure over the past three to four months is, is what we collected the samples. Um, overall, we found relatively low concentrations of blood cadmium compared to what's been um, presented or reported in the literature among smoking with uh, pregnant women who live with smokers. But we did see an effect of the air cleaner. So we found that uh, intervention participants on average had 14% lower concentrations compared to control participants. We also found significantly higher blood cadmium concentrations and hair nicotine concentrations among participants who lived with smokers. Um, and we found stronger correlations between both measures, so between blood cadmium and hair nicotine among participants who reported living with the smoker versus those who did not. So this gave us um, more confidence that the blood cadmium concentrations are really a biomarker for second hand smoke. So the other analysis I wanted to talk about today was the effect of the air cleaners on birth outcomes. So for that analysis, this is our trial profile or what our data looks like. So the first half is similar to what you've already seen. Um, so we followed until the end of pregnancy 253 participants in our control group and 269 in our intervention group. Um, we, unfortunately, there was a number of pregnancy losses, either miscarriages or stillbirths in both groups. Uh, and then there was also some neonatal deaths, which we defined as a death occurring within the first two weeks delivery, and one child was born with Down syndrome, so we excluded these participants. Um, and we did, to analyze the effect of the intervention on our different outcomes, we did two types of analyses. We did a complete case analysis, where we included all of the participants who had a live birth. So again, um, all of these people, so the people um, for whom we had uh, complete data for and who had a, a healthy live birth. And then we also did an intention to treat analysis, which basically um, includes all the participants who were randomized. And after they were randomized, you basically ignore everything that happened afterwards. So you ignore any mistakes that were given in terms of the treatment. So again, which is why even though some of our participants, just a handful of our participants were given the wrong intervention, we analyzed their data according to what they were randomized. And then it also ignores the fact that some people were lost to follow up. So for those people that were lost to follow up, we intruded data, um, their outcome data for these participants using multiple integrations. Um, and then we, to analyze the effects or to um, look at the effects of the intervention, we did linear and logistic regression for a categorical, or sorry, continuous and categorical variable. And then for gestational age, because the distribution is non normal, we did a time to event analysis. So we looked we estimated hazard ratios for time to alive birth. So this uh, table shows baseline characteristics of our participants uh, in our control and our intervention group. And again, the main idea here is just to show you that both of our groups were very similar in terms of uh, the age, the mother's age at enrollment, the gestational age at enrollment, uh, their household income, their education, their uh, marital status. Um, our groups are also very similar in terms of uh, working outside of the home and other variables as well. 
this table shows a uh, summary of our birth characteristics. So uh, type of delivery, the sex of the child, the season they were born in, and again, our, both groups are very similar. Um, and then on the bottom half of the table is a summary of our birth outcomes. So our main outcome for uh, birth weight, gestational age, birth strength, um, head circumference. Chondral index is a ratio of birth weight to birth length. And then we have uh, our other variables, low birth weight, which again is being less than 2,500 grams, uh, small for gestational age, and two times. Um, there were no significant differences here, but we did have more preterm births in our interim table. So uh, we, have, we didn't find any significant differences between our groups or any significant effects of the intervention when we looked at all of our births. So this includes both the preterm births as well as the term births, so it's births occurring after, at or after 37 weeks gestation. But we did see an effect um, for birth weight. So we found that on average, um, babies born to women in the intervention group were 86 times higher in birth weight. Uh, we also found an effect on gestational age-adjusted birth weight, a close to significant effect on birth length, and then we also found a prospective effect of small for gestational age. Um, the other thing which we, again, weren't expecting to find was a, this wasn't a significant effect, but we did find an elevated risk of preterm birth, so I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, similar to our other analyses, we wanted to see if there was any uh, specific factors that might affect or influence um, the effect of the air cleaner on these outcomes. So we found that uh, secondhand smoke exposure, the reported air cleaner use, so the reporting uh, whether or not they, how long they, you know, over what percentage of the study period the air cleaners were used for, the time spent at home, the sex of the child, season of birth, none of that really affected the air cleaner effectiveness or the effect of the air cleaner on our outcome. Um, the effect estimates from our intention to treat analysis were very similar to what we found in our complete case analysis, except for two outcomes. So small for gestational age, the effect is no longer protective or significant. So we think that this, the effect, effect estimate from our complete case analysis wasn't very robust. For preterm birth, we still found an elevated risk, um, but lower compared to what we had found in our complete case analysis. So to explore this potential effect a little bit more, we did some additional uh, sensitivity analyses. And I don't want to get into too much detail about them. But uh, basically, we included data for women who had a pregnancy loss. And we considered these kind of counterfactual scenarios to say if these vulnerable pregnancies hadn't ended in pregnancy losses, but instead ended in um, live births that were shorter in duration and babies that were lower in birth weight compared to our complete cases, what would the risk of preterm birth be? So looking at that data, we actually found that the um, risk wasn't elevated. So we think that our, because we had more pregnancy losses in our control group compared to our intervention group, we think that the uh, results were sensitive to that finding, and that's why we were finding that elevated risk for preterm. And I can talk a little bit more about that if anybody has questions. Um, another um, finding we weren't expecting to see was this kind of differential um, pregnancy loss between the groups. So we had more pregnancy losses, more stillbirths and miscarriages, or mostly stillbirths in our control group compared to our intervention group. So we decided to also look at the effect of the air cleaner on this outcome as a uh, additional adverse outcome. And we found that the air cleaners were protective. Of the so those are basically are basically a summary of the results so far from these, these analyses. Um, and before wrapping up, I just wanted to discuss a few limitations of the study. So the biggest limitation is probably that the participants were blinded to their intervention assignment. So participants who were in the intervention group because they were given the air cleaners knew they were in the intervention group, and participants in the control group knew they were in the control group. And other studies that have looked at air cleaner use have um, used sham air cleaners, where on the outside it looks like a regular air cleaner, but the filter is actually removed. So that way control participants don't actually know that they're in the control group. Um, and we decided, or the decision was made not to use sham filters or sham air cleaners, mostly for budgetary reasons. 
So we basically chose to uh, enroll a larger number of participants versus using those same number of airplanes for our control purposes. Um, and most of our outcomes are objective, so hopefully that should limit the potential bias from that, from participants doing their assignments. Um, again, we also had uh, differential loss to follow up, so we had a higher number of people withdrawing for whatever reason in our control group versus our intervention group. And we did look at uh, some variables uh, between the participants who were lost to follow up and those who remained in the study. So things like mother's age, gestational age of enrollment, household income, those kind of things. And we didn't see any differences. Um, but they could, the two groups potentially could have differed in ways that we weren't able to see. Um, the intervention was implemented at a mean of about 11 weeks. So we missed a lot of that first trimester. Um, and it's not really clear right now. There's not a lot of evidence on specific critical windows of exposure during pregnancy where aeroplane exposures are particularly detrimental to fetal growth. But the evidence that's out there right now suggests that exposures in early pregnancy and exposures in later pregnancy are um, most important. So our intervention is potentially less, shown to be less effective because we did miss that early pregnancy. Um, and then again, we weren't able to assess the use of the intervention over time. Uh, we weren't able to use that um, timer data. Also, we weren't able to assess potentially pa patterns of use. So we've heard anecdotally from our study technicians that some participants shut the air cleaners off at night because they, some of them found them too noisy. So we, that's also something we weren't able to really assess. So the next steps for me working on this project is to look at the role of indoor PM2.5 and secondhand smoke exposures um, during pregnancy on the birth outcomes that we've looked at. And the reason I'm able to do this is because of another student um, who's now a student here, Viren, who's teaching here. Um, for her master's, she worked on this project and she developed a model that will allow us to predict indoor PM2.5 concentrations over the entire uh, period, a study period for each participant. So that way I can use that model to look at um, exposures over the whole pregnancy as well as each trimester. Um, and the main motivation for looking at this, for doing this analysis, is that a lot of um, places that are highly polluted because of outdoor air pollution are, also have high smoking rates. And this is something that hasn't been really looked at, is this joint effect of PM outdoor air pollution as well as secondhand smoke exposures on fetal growth. So just to wrap up, uh, uh, we found that these portable HEPA filter air cleaners um, are linked with uh, lower indoor PM2.5 concentrations, lower blood cadmium concentrations, which again we think are is a biomarker of secondhand smoke exposure, um, greater birth weight, greater birth length, as well as the decreased risk of miscarriage. Um, this study is one of the few intervention studies to look at the link between air pollution exposures during pregnancy and fetal growth. And it's the first study of air cleaners and these outcomes. Um, and although we've shown that the air cleaners are effective, again, in reducing uh, PM2.5 concentrations as well as uh, improved fetal growth, uh, so they're really important household level interventions, especially when we're talking about vulnerable populations or vulnerable time periods and um, high pollution events or high pollution setting. But what's really important to remember is that focusing specifically only on household level interventions puts the onus on the individual. And it's really important to also think about long-term um, interventions that target community-wide emissions so that everybody in the population can benefit from exposure reduction. So I just want to end by saying thank you to all of our study participants, our uh, study team, uh, with some of whom I've listed here. And then at the bottom is the website for our research um, project. And then this is just a very small group of uh, our, the uh, UGAR study team and our area designer, UGAR teaching. So thank you. for this absolutely fantastic presentation and um, very interesting project. So I am going to start by um, relaying some of the questions that we have here on our uh, remote listeners. Um, 
There's a few. So um, probably go back and forth between here and um, so the first question that I have is, um, um, are there products um, that combine both particle and gaseous fil filtration? So something like a, a HEPA plus NOx scrubber, for instance, for residential use that may clean important emissions from indoor sources and some motor vehicle contributions for cities. Um, so there's not a lot of air cleaners that are designed for residential settings that address um, gases pollutants. Um, a lot of times these HEPA filter air cleaners um, come with three filters that have activated carbon filters and that takes away, those are meant, mostly meant for um, smells and stuff, but that does address some gaseous pollutants, but there's really not anything that I know of that's designed for that. Thank you. The other one is um, from Sarah, and actually I was also piqued by, um, by it, and I, you did touch on it throughout your, your um, talk. It was about the uh, number of miscarriages. There's considerably consider really more miscarriages in the control group than the treatment group. Um, and then you show that when you look at ITT versus complete case, it is sensitive to that. So is there enough data to say anything about this? Um, so we, yeah, so we did find a protective effect of miscarriages in our population. Um, and there's not a lot of evidence on the link between air pollution exposures and risk of miscarriage. Um, and the limited evidence that is around is conflicting. So some studies have found a link between outdoor air pollution and increased risk of miscarriage, and other studies haven't found any link. So it's really hard to say. Sure. So thanks, Prochi. Just a, a technical question. So how did you define um, uh, small for gestational age? Um, we, so it's uh, less than the 10th percentile for gestational, uh, for birth weight for gestational age in sex. And the reference population we used for, uh, was um, um, Doesn't matter. No, sorry, um, but yeah, we weren't able to get uh, specific information for uh, Ulaanbaatar or for Mongolia, so that's why we used another reference population. Uh, these standards were just developed and then submitting them in an email. So I, I guess that one of the reasons I was asking was because so the numbers were small, and you would actually expect if your reference population is is representative, it would have been about ten percent. Yeah. So another thing you could do is just use your population and use, um, define it as those under 10% for we your population. We thought about doing that, but the problem is um, when we start to look at gestational use, our numbers get really small. So that was the problem, kind of an internal reference based on our chaotic control. Right, okay. Because it seems like there was something going on there and actually but you still had really small numbers yeah. so if there's something else you could do to try and get a better yeah. measure of what was actually low for your population. Um, so one thing we did use, um, so first we used this reference population, which I, again I'm forgetting the name of it, um, so we looked at the less, uh, small for gestational age was defined as being less than the 10th percentile, but then we also looked at less than the 20th percentile and we didn't see an increase in numbers. So I definitely agree that maybe that reference may not be appropriate for our population, but we weren't able to get that information. So that's another limitation for sure. Thanks, Prabhjeet. Um, I think, uh, thank you also for doing kind of intervention research. I think it's very challenging and you've done a good job of trying to address some of the issues that arise. and alleviate um, concerns people have around some of these intervention evaluations. But um, I have, a, I guess, just an education question for me. Um, you know, filters are a good thing. They're reducing the levels, which is never a bad thing. But even with, even when the filters are used, it's still 
would be considered, relatively speaking, high levels. Yeah, it's, this is still a place, even when the filters are working, where the levels in the intervention homes are still, you would consider high. I kind of missed the level. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, again, we, in Ulaanbaatar, there's this kind of strong, there's dominant source, you know, for seasonal effect that wintertime concentrations are high, but that doesn't mean that in the summer the concentrations are low, we just say, relatively speaking. So it's still a highly polluted community in yeah. her setting, whether or not, it's what, no matter what season you're talking about. Yeah. It's still considered a high, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, this went by quickly for me. On the slide where you were talking about the miscarriages, there was a second finding around stillbirths. Yes. That went quickly, I think, that seemed to say something different. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Or did you not, did you talk about that and I missed it? The stillbirth? Yeah, no, I didn't talk about that. Oh. So, um, yeah, so we had more stillbirths in our intervention group compared to with our control group. Right. Um, but I don't know how much we can say. The small it's numbers. Just because, again, we have such small numbers. Yeah. And again, there is some evidence that um, suggests that increased air pollution exposures towards the end of pregnancy are related to increases in stillbirth. Um, but again, because we have such small numbers, we can't really explore it. So we can really look at if this was happening more in the winter when the air pollution exposures are higher towards the end of pregnancy versus not. So, Definitely interesting, but yeah, we're limited in what we can do with it. Hey, Parish, I have a question for you. So, um, I know you asked us not to focus on the big table where you have all the characteristics, right? But I was wondering if you had any information about the physical activity of the mothers, because that could potentially mitigate the effect of air pollution. That's a good question, and no, <laughs> we didn't collect information on that. Um, we did in the first and second questionnaire that was administered, we had a question related to time activity patterns. So we asked um, participants how much time um, in a day they spend at home versus outside versus commuting in a car. So we tried to get some information, but we didn't really have anything specific about um, physical activity. And we also collected information on um, you know, medication use and uh, vitamins. Good so I'm going to come back to um, the remote listeners. Um, there's a question asking, did you attribute increased PM 2.5 to other sources besides smoking? Um, yeah, so the, again, the dominant source is residential coal burning. Um, so that was the largest source of PM 2.5. And although we collected indoor PM 2.5 measurements. Again, the reason why we collected these measurements in whole and apartments versus bears is because we didn't want to, we didn't want that indoor generated PM. So the indoor generated, or the indoor measurements of PM that we're collecting are attributed to secondhand smoke, for sure, and homes for smokers, but also to this infiltration of outdoor PM 2.5 that's coming indoors from the, um, residential coal burning and from the uh, power plant and from traffic and other sources. Ready for another question? Sure. Okay. So this is from Kay. Um, such a wonderful project, Prabhjit. Um, loved hearing about a randomized control trial of an exposure control method. It is um, very interesting that noise was an issue that made some people not use their air cleaner, especially at night. Do you know if there is a way to reduce the noise? Um, you get quieter. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, I mean, I think this would have been an interesting um, question to also ask participants. Is, were you affected by the noise? And again, this idea of some participants turning the air cleaners off at night because they found them noisy was anecdotal. So we can't really quantify to say like 25% of participants found that air cleaners noisy. Um, and these are supposed to be the quieter models, but for some people are sensitive to more noise versus less. So yeah. definitely a good question and something that would have been good to ask. Maybe quantify. So I do have a last question here before we wrap up. Um, so when it comes to an outcome like cadmium, um, the um, the person is asking if there could be exposure from rice or other bioaccumulating foods 
for other populations where cadmium, cadmium exposure may not be from smoking or air pollution exposures? Yeah, and that's a good question. And again, that's why we wanted to kind of um, quantify this relationship between the high nicotine content and the blood cadmium. Because uh, there's different sources of cadmium in, in the environment, and one is diet. Um, bean leaf is a big source of cadmium um, exposure. And in our population, um, we really suspect that because the participants, the majority of them were living with smokers, and smoking rates are quite high in Ulaanbaatar and Mongolia, that uh, the secondhand smoke exposures were really the biggest source of cadmium. And again, that was kind of confirmed um, when we looked at the relationship between the two. Thank you. So um, please join me in thanking Prabhjit for a fantastic presentation. And um, thank you, Prabhjit. <laughs>